Can I show you my favourite piece of pixel art? I don't know why I'm asking, because I'm going to show you anyway. Here it is. It's called Four Byte Burger, and it was done by a guy named Jack Hager back in 1985. It's brilliant, it's whimsical, and it appeals both to my love of 80s aesthetics and of hamburgers. It's also among the first artwork ever produced on an Amiga. Jack Hager was the art director at Commodore, and he produced a series of images very early on in the machine's life to demonstrate its artistic capabilities. Some of these images have been preserved, but some, 4 by burger included, have been lost. You see, the software Jack was using was in such an early stage of development that it lacked a save feature entirely. There was no way of storing the images you created to disk. The only reproduction we have of 4 by burger is a photograph of the screen taken while the image was still in memory. A literal screenshot. The photograph was printed in the premiere issue of Amiga World magazine and in the manual for Graphicraft, the software Jack was using. So we have these prints, at least. It's a nice enough capture, but it's not the pixel-perfect original. That's gone. But can we bring it back? Could we make a perfect reproduction? A digital restoration? It would be counterfeit, sure, but it's a part of history. And, more to the point, it's my favourite. So, where do we start? Well, it might be an idea to get an idea of some of the more basic parameters first. Resolution, colour depth, that sort of thing. We know the image was created on an Amiga, almost certainly an NTSC model. If we look at the image, the pixels themselves appear approximately square, and it doesn't seem to be an interlaced image. It is highly likely that we are looking at the standard, low resolution of the Amiga 1000, which, on an NTSC machine, is 320 pixels by 200. However, there's something unusual about the image. It's taller than it is wide, and the scan lines are vertical. Every single CRT monitor I've encountered scans horizontally, which seems to imply that either the camera or the monitor itself has been rotated by 90 degrees. It seems likely that the image was created using a monitor that was placed on its side. An impressively low-tech solution to attaining a portrait orientation. I do wonder if Jack held the mouse at a right angle to correct for this when drawing, or perhaps there was a more sophisticated solution. I don't suppose it matters much, as we've likely arrived at a conclusion for the image's size. The standard Amiga resolution rotated by 90 degrees gives us 200 pixels by 320. Another thing to consider is that the photograph might not have captured the entire screen. Some of the border may have been cropped. In order to size the image properly and to get close pixel alignment with the original, it would be helpful to know how much of the screen we're missing. We can get a reasonably good estimate of this by counting the scan lines. While the pixels might not line up exactly, it seems the pixel boundaries are relatively well aligned. By measuring the distance between a group of scan lines peak to peak, and dividing by the number of scan lines we counted, we can extrapolate a pixel density and get a rough width of the visible screen area. Each scan line is 8.95 pixels across, and the visible area is 1682 pixels, which means we have 187 scan lines across the width of the photograph. This is 93.5% of the 200 pixel width we assumed, which seems like a reasonable crop. For the height, we can do the same. 2,251 pixels of the photograph corresponds to 251 pixels in the final image. But this seems wrong. That would only account for 78% of the 320 pixels. But fear not, there is a reason for this discrepancy. Pixels on an NTSC display like this aren't exactly square. A 4 to 3 aspect ratio would need to have 240 lines to have square pixels, and so 200 lines means the pixels are stretched vertically by a factor of 1.2. As the monitor is rotated, this means that the pixels in our photograph are squashed vertically. 
So we can multiply the original estimate of 251 by 1.2 to get 301 pixels, which is 94% of our assumed original vertical resolution of 320. So the cropped version we see is approximately 301 pixels by 187, a 94% crop of the original resolution of 320 by 200. So that's our target size. Now it might be helpful to work out how many colors Jack used, so we can start to pin down a palette. In theory, the Amiga could display 4096 colors at once in the ham display mode. But I don't think that many colors were necessary for this image, and as far as I know, Graphicraft didn't offer support for ham. The conventional Amiga graphics modes offered 1 to 5 bit color depth for 2, 4, 8, 16 or 32 colors. There was a 6-bit mode called Extra Half Bright, which offered an additional 32 colors of half brightness, but the earliest Amigas didn't support this. If we look at Jack Hager's other work, the surviving digital files, we can see that the majority use 5-bit color depth for a palette of 32 colors. I think it's reasonable to assume that 4-byte burger is the same. We can't sample the exact original colors from the photograph, as the pixels are blurred and the color balance is likely to be off anyway. But we can start to build our palette by sampling discrete shades. If we start to pick out the various colors used on each of the elements, we find that we've got around 50 different colors, which is too many. Luckily though, many of these colors are very similar and we can effectively merge them and reuse them. And so, with a bit of consolidation, we're left with a palette of 30 colors, just within budget. These colors are not the exact originals, however. They've been filtered through phosphor, lens, film, and print reproduction. It's a nice palette, but we're looking for authenticity. To get closer to the originals, we could look at some of the other palettes Jack has used and see if we can emulate the tones he might have picked. In fact, there is another surviving image that has a startling similarity to 4x Burger. And here it is. It's called Jumbo Dog, and it's possibly my second favorite piece of pixel art. I mean, look at it. It's whimsical. It's animated. Anyway, the bun mustard ketchup pickle combo covers a lot of the same colors as its burger-based contemporary. So I'm wondering if the palette used might share some similarities. One thing we can do is adjust the color balance of our initial 30 color palette to better match the one found in Jumbo Dog. The original colors are much more saturated than they appear in the photograph. The delicate cerulean background might be closer to a pure spectral blue instead. Anyway, once we've tuned our palette to match Jumbo Dogs, we can start to look for colors that might be identical. And it seems a few of the colors have been reused. With a little color juggling, we arrive at a palette that should be close to the original. And we've got room for a couple more shades, should the need arise. One thing to consider is that the Amiga only had 4 bits per color channel, instead of the usual 8 bits. This means that instead of 256 levels of red, green and blue, there's only 16. So we can adjust our palette to the nearest 4-bit value for each channel, to give us a palette that fits the original hardware limitations. So now we have a resolution, a crop factor, and a color palette. It's time to start the reproduction. I'll be using Photoshop for this, as it's what I'm familiar with, and it's more than capable. But viewers are reminded that other art packages are available. Setting up the document is easy. A new document with the required resolution and ensuring that we set the correct pixel aspect ratio of 1.2. If the image were oriented normally, we'd use 0.83 instead. But the vertical stretch of the NTSC monitor is rotated, so we want slightly wider pixels instead. Next, I'll import our palette from Illustrator on a new layer and paint the background layer in a fetching shade of blue. Next, a new layer with a rectangle of 301 pixels by 187 so I can line up the photograph as a reference. And I import the photograph and resize it to fit the expected pixel dimensions. We ought to be close to the original pixel size, but I don't expect it to be exact. 
so I'll have to make reference to the full-size photo to get closer to a pixel-perfect rendition. Next, I'll outline the elements in a contrasting colour. Pure magenta is a good choice here, and I start to construct the outlines of each of the elements. I start with the top bun, as it's completely visible, and I consider drawing the hidden parts of the lower overlapped elements, as this will allow me to do more later. Next, the mustard, tomato, onion, pickle, ketchup, floppy disk, lettuce, cheese, and the lower bun. Finally, we add all of the burger-related detritus, and we've completed the outlines of all the elements. Next, I'll flood fill all the opaque areas of the burger elements, and these will serve as a mask for painting each part. By creating a new layer and applying a clipping mask by alt-clicking, we can paint freely on this layer without fear of changing the outlines we've defined. We can start by colouring each element appropriately, and then the work on shading and adding detail can begin. It's at this point that it's worth looking at Jack's other work again to better understand the techniques he used. We can see a lot of dithering on Jumbo Dog, particularly on the bun. So I start with the darkest colour of the top bun and start to work on the brown pixels, trying to match the dithering pattern I can see in the photograph. But I'm not too worried about it being perfect, as I think that's a route to insanity. As long as the final product replicates the technique, I think the likeness should be good. There's also some orange pixels sprinkled into the mix, so I add those in before ascending in lightness to the next bun colour. Eventually, impatience gets the better of me, and I start to take a slightly more freehand approach to the dithering, rather than slavishly adhere to the pixels I can see. Some of the shades are difficult to differentiate, and I think the end result will be better if I rely on my intuition rather than attempting to make this a paint-by-numbers affair. In any case, I'll be on my own when it comes to shading the hidden parts. Once the initial shading is complete, I'm reasonably happy with the progress, although I think I need to re-emphasise the detail on the sesame seeds. So I add a new detail layer and paint those as a separate element. This allows us a little more definition, and I mirror the pixel shapes I can see. It is at this point I'm realising how forgiving the phosphor blur and scan lines can be on the original. Anyway, I can always retouch as necessary, so once I've arrived at a result that's passable, I move on to the mustard. Thankfully, the shading here is a little simpler with fewer colours, and it's easy to extend it into the hidden section, before we move on to the slightly more complex tomato. I'm not sure about some of the colours. The brown could stand to be a little darker, perhaps a little more desaturated, and I'm not sure if I've chosen the right orange. So I swap in some alternates, using one of these spare palette slots for a darker red. Anyway, with a little creative license, I finish the tomato slice and move on to the onion. It's relatively simple, with just a little shading. Ketchup is next, which is similar in construction to the mustard. Then, the floppy disk. Much of the floppy disk is a flat colour, with highlights and lowlights along the edges. I try and make it as geometric as possible, following a stair-step pattern whenever possible, but the reference image deviates from this a little, and the photograph seems to reflect those irregularities. It's not how I would have done it, I might have kept it perfectly aligned to the pixel grid, but I do my best to balance a consistent line with the original. There's some shadowing from the ketchup above, and I add some darker shades with a random dither to replicate this. Next, the lettuce. This is quite a complex layer with quite a few colours and a lot of shading to do. We start with the darkest areas, establishing the leafy form, and staying as true to the reference as possible. Next, we build up shades from the darkest to the midtones. Then we add the areas of brightest highlight and ramp down to the midtones. After a little cleanup and refining any obvious lines into a more natural appearance, we start to blend the different greens with the addition of some random dithering. The end result is pleasantly lettuce-like, and seems to match the original reasonably well. The obscured areas aren't quite as natural, but, well, they'll be obscured. Next is the cheese, which is a relatively simple shaded area. Three main shades of yellow, and I pick out the highlights per the reference, and work down to the principal cheese hue. 
I add a fourth darker shade towards the back of the burger, which is normally hidden under the lettuce. The final major component is the lower bun, for which I take a similar approach to the top bun. I make use of the same selection of colours and again start with the darkest areas and build up the shading with new layers for each colour. The main difference between the bottom and top part of the bun is the visible bready area. Here I use some new colours including some beige tones from the floppy disk to impart a paler bread-like texture. Again much of the bun is hidden but I fill in these details as best as I can for a more flexible image that we can recompose. Once the burger is completed from bun to bun, the only part left to do is the flying detritus that surrounds the burger and gives 4x burger its sense of chaotic energy. These particles are generally quite small and consist of what appear to be sesame seeds and onion fragment. So I pluck the colours from the respective part of the larger burger hole and give the particles a sense of lighting. That completed, all the elements are in place and we have our completed burger composition. It is at this moment I am humbled at a thought. This is as close as anyone has got to gazing upon the raw pixels that comprise the image since its creation in 1985. For nearly 40 years, all that remained of this image was a filtered facsimile in the form of a photograph. And now, I was gazing at the naked glory of 4 Byte Burger. It was a fake, sure, but the product of a painstaking restoration that had taken a day and a half of careful work. I wondered how long Jack had spent on it. I suspect his time was more expressive. Less time spent concerned about accuracy and more time simply committing pixels to canvas. He must have known that his work was destined to be ephemeral. That at some point he would have to flick a switch and condemn his effort to a digital grave never to return. It was clear that I was afflicted with a burger madness. So it was at this point I decided to take a break. With the image finished, the next step is to save it out and finalize the palette. I'd been working in RGB color in order to retain the ability to have layers, but it was time to flatten everything down and convert to indexed colors. I changed the image mode in Photoshop and the final color count is 28, well within our 32 color budget and a number that sounds reasonably feasible as a match for the original. While Jack had 32 colors to play with, it's entirely possible he didn't use them all. Next, it's time to upscale the image and correct the aspect ratio so it displays correctly on square pixel displays. I restore the default pixel aspect ratio, then scale up the image by 600% horizontally and 500% vertically to preserve its original appearance. This gives us a final image of 1200 by 1600 pixels, a 4 to 3 aspect ratio, where the original drawn pixels are 6 by 5 each. This is the smallest size that preserves the original pixel integrity. Any smaller and we'd have to downsample, losing the hard pixel boundary. And so, the image is complete a relatively faithful recreation of a long-lost piece of pixel art. I'm glad to have it back. One thing I want to do with this image is present it in the way it was originally. On an Amiga, on an authentic CRT, rotated onto its side. This requires some setup. Ideally, I'll use Graphicraft, the original software, to display it. So I'll need to find a copy of it and save up 4 byte burger in a format it can read. Luckily, Photoshop still supports the Amiga's main format, IFF or Interchange File Format. So it's a simple case of rotating the image to the desired orientation and selecting Save As, then choosing IFF as our output format. I'm not 100% certain that Graphicraft will read an IFF file exported from Photoshop, so I test it first in emulation. I find an ADF containing an early version of Graphicraft from 1985, version 1.1. Then I create a blank ADF disk image and copy my burger rendition onto it. At just 22 kilobytes, there's plenty of room. Next, I fire up WinUAE, an Amiga emulator, and attempt to boot, only to find the Graphicraft disk isn't bootable. Not a problem. 
I replace it with a copy of Workbench, reboot, then wait for it to load. Once ready, I insert Graphicraft into the virtual second drive and attempt to load that. Without drama, it starts up, and then I swap the Workbench disk for the one I created and attempt to load my image. The file requester is primitive and doesn't seem to let me select which disk drive I want to read from. I attempt to type the disk drive name into the text field, realize I've loaded a German version of Workbench with a different key map, struggle to locate the colon necessary to indicate a drive name, and eventually type in the full path of 4 by burger. It doesn't work. Undeterred, I boot into an English version of Workbench this time and open a CLI window. I first copy 4bytburger.iff to the RAM disk, then copy from there directly onto the Graphgraph disk. I marvel at my ingenuity for a second as I consider that I could have done the same thing in Windows on ADF Opus instead of going to the trouble of making a new disk image and flexing my memory of Amiga shell commands. Nevertheless, I was ready to try Graphgraph again. I bring up the file requester, but see no mention of my file. I type in the file name and it loads promisingly, but nothing more than a blank screen appears. I'm wondering if Graphicraft supports IFF files at all. I try a later version of Graphicraft, but still no joy. Dismayed but undeterred, I revert to a familiar favourite, Deluxe Paint 3, and I'm able to negotiate to my burger volume and attempt to load the IFF. Deluxe Paint informs me that it's a mangled IFF file. So much for Photoshop's compatibility. I try Earth and View, which can read the file but lacks IFF export. So, after a little googling, I use an online tool to re export the IFF file. And, success! It now loads into DPaint 3 with no issues. Well, almost no issues. I'm emulating a PAL system, so there are 256 lines instead of 200, which means the aspect ratio won't be correct. Back in the day, this wouldn't have been seen as much of an issue. You'd cope with the blank space at the bottom of the screen, rather than tweak your monitor settings every time you wanted to display an image intended for an NTSC display. But we're going for authenticity, so I'll need to find a way to get my Amiga 2000 to display NTSC modes. There are two ways, as I understand it. One is in hardware, by changing a jumper setting on the motherboard. The other is in software. If you're running the later 3.0 ROMs, you can do it directly in the boot menu. This is by far the easiest way, but I'm unsure if Graphicraft will work with these ROMs. Older software doesn't play nice with newer ROMs. So I tested an emulation. A 3.1 system with 10 megs of RAM, and I boot into Workbench 3.1. I then attempt to load Graphicraft, and it works. For good measure, I load in the burger pick, and I see it load in slowly. So the good news is, I don't have to start messing with jumper settings. I can use the boot menu to switch into NTSC, and Graphicraft should work without complaint. It's time to take theory into practice, and start lugging old hardware into position. I gingerly ease down the aging monitor, aware that it is nearly as old as I am, and hope everything still works. With components connected, I flick the power switch and things lurch into life. A dim workbench screen appears as the phosphors slowly warm, to confirm that my Amiga 2000 is, in fact, operational. The monitor I'm using is a Commodore 1084, a fine display, although the example I have isn't the greatest. The image is a little blurry, the colour not great. It will have to do. My other 1084 died during the production of Trackers, so I press on. I boot the Amiga into an NTSC screen mode, to be greeted with a PAL workbench display. So, I install the NTSC monitor type into my devs directory, then reboot and select the correct mode. Luckily, the 1084 monitor will happily display either a PAL or NTSC signal. Starting DPaint 4, as it's installed on my hard disk already, I select the low-res NTSC screen mode, and it is correctly presented as filling the screen. So now I need to get the necessary data onto the original machine itself. This should be simple enough. I have a GoTek floppy emulator hooked up to an external drive cable, so I can plug into the rear of the machine and deliver data from virtual disks. 
I'll need both the Graphicraft disc and my burger image, so I load those up on a USB drive, connect the GoTech, and reboot the Amiga. I copy the files from my discs to my hard drive, then load up Graphicraft and attempt to load 4x Burger. There's a bit of a problem, as it seems Graphicraft doesn't run perfectly under Kickstart 3. My mouse cursor is missing, and there's some graphical corruption in the menus, which seems to be a consequence of using a later ROM. I can work around it though, selecting the text field blind, which takes a few attempts, and then typing the file name before pressing return. The file requester then closes and the screen goes a promising shade of blue. And a few seconds later, our burger appears. Selecting the hide title bar option in the drop down menu presents the image in its full glory. But of course, it's the wrong way round. The monitor would have been placed on its side originally. So for maximum authenticity, I very carefully rotate the monitor and place it on its side. Immediately, I spot a problem. The corner of the image has been discoloured. What should be blue is red instead. It looks as though a magnetic field is deflecting the electrons inside the tube slightly, causing the hue shift. This could be from the speakers inside the monitor case or another magnetised component moving as I rotate the monitor. But it's clear that the 1084 is not designed to be used on its side. I restore it to its proper orientation and thankfully the discoloration is no longer present. But how can I recreate the original presentation? It turns out there is a way. Someone in my Discord server has experienced a similar issue, and the solution is to leave the monitor in the portrait orientation for a period of time before powering on. So that's what I do. I leave it overnight, and in the morning I power on the monitor to see the discoloration has completely gone. How does it know? What sort of arcane magic is this? I don't suppose it matters. When it comes to ancient hardware, sometimes it's best not to question things. The fact is, it works. So this way, I am able to capture 4 by Burger in almost the same way Jack did in 1985. The image is a fake. A digital reconstruction done in modern software. The hardware, not quite authentic. Jack would have used an Amiga 1000, probably with a Commodore 1080 monitor. And I'm using a digital camera rather than shooting on film. But short of sourcing the exact rare vintage hardware and probing Jack for information on what type of camera and lens he might have used, I think we're pretty close. We have a good facsimile of the original, presented on a display with a very similar picture tube. Vertical scan lines visible with soft phosphor glow. Our image is a little more blue, but if we convert to CMYK, as one would for printing, we see a shade closer to the original Cerulean. I think we have arrived. 4 Byte Burger has come full circle. We have conducted digital necromancy and brought a lost image back from the dead. Only this time, we don't have to flick the switch. We can keep it. In fact, we needn't stop there. We can even animate it. As we not only recreated the visible portions of the burger, but extrapolated the hidden areas in a layered artwork, we can save out those layers and recompose the image to our liking. We can make the burger bounce. Seeing the once lost image merrily dance up and down on my screen fills me with a certain joy. And as much as I'm tempted to further refine the animation, it could use a little squash and squeeze to really sell the bounce, I feel as though the journey has come to an end. After all, it's just a picture of a burger from 1985. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that significant. Reproducing it doesn't change much. So what's the point? I think it's pretty easy to dismiss work like this. Certainly at the time, computer art wasn't really regarded as true art. But things have changed. Now a great deal of art is digital. And 4 by Burger is really part of that transition. It was the dawn of a new medium. And 16-bit machines like the Amiga brought new possibilities to the world of computer art. 
And I think the techniques and limitations that formed this expression are worth studying as part of a broader history of computer graphics. There's definitely no harm in their preservation, and if we can reproduce an image that was lost, then we can fill in a gap and perhaps learn some things along the way. So was it a waste of time? Yes, but a worthwhile waste of time. And that's good enough for me. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, farewell.